Today is a great day because today Chess Centurion returns to regular scheduled videos. It will not be a video a day as it used to be. I just went on a bit of a break recently, so thank you all for understanding. But it will be like three or four videos a week is the plan. I've got some very, very exciting things in the works currently, and I will let you all know what that is when that happens, but I'm really uh, excited about it. But today, we'll be returning to the Kairo Khan vs Everything series with episode 17. If you're new to the channel, the way this works is I play a 15 minute plus 10 second rapid game on chess.com. Whether I have the white or the black pieces, we play the Kairo Khan setup, obviously try to win, climb some rating, and I'll be explaining my thought process while I'm playing. I haven't really actually been playing much chess over the past couple of weeks because I've been away on holiday. Uh, very relaxed now, so I'm very excited to get back to chess. So it'll be interesting to see whether my um, whether my gameplay takes a hit because of the lack of practice. But yeah, I hope you guys will enjoy this video, and it's great to be back. Let's get into it. All right, we are against AAA two six six one from I want to say Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan. Okay, well that is a fail, but. He plays 1e4, so we can get a proper Karo Khan going here. I normally am really good with my flags, so this is um a bit sad. Whoa, my opponent goes for the hillbilly attack. I actually am sure I mentioned this in um the last video I did on the channel, I think. Or maybe the one before. But anyway, I have mentioned this before. The hillbilly attack is weird, because I'm going to go d5, right? I'm going to put pressure on the 4-pawn, attack the bishop. White has to take, really. There are interesting lines where white retreats to b3 and then uh, d takes e4 is played and the point is to open the bishop up on the diagonal, potentially bring the queen out, but I think it's a bit of a silly opening because the knight can't come to f3 when that is played and why lose a pawn for no reason. So we have the exchange and I assume the bishop is going to drop back to b3. That is normally what happens and we're just going to develop as normal and what we want to do is... What well, what would be the dream is something like bishop b3, knight f6, knight f3, put a bishop on g4, so basically get the bishop outside of the pawn chain. f5 would be fine as well, but I'm not as big of a fan of bishop f5 in many positions, also because he's controlling the uh, c2 square with his bishop. So we want to get the bishop outside the pawn chain, go e6 to lock our d5 pawn in place and make it very difficult if his bishop goes back to b3 to actually partake in the game. Because if we can shut off the a2 to g8 diagonal, this one, then his bishop is not going to have a great time. Yes, he could always reroute to somewhere like a4. He could even go bishop b5 check now, which he does. But I'm not worried. Knight c6 is definitely playable, but I think bishop to d7 is better because we're going to offer him a trade. I want to say queen e2 is probably the best move here to defend his bishop. Of course, we're not going to take him and allow something like queen b5, which would force us to trade queens. That's what he's going to do. We can probably go a6, which is never a bad move in the Karo Khan. We could go knight f6 and just develop normally, defend the d5 pawn. It's decent. Knight c6 I think would not be great because I want to trade off my bishop because I'm going to take control of the light squares with my pawns which makes me think that a6 is a good move because either he trades and then I just build up more light square defense get my queen out to d7 or he retreats to like d3 and that's horrific so let's trade I want my queen to go to d7 I don't see the point in putting my knight on d7. I don't know where it's going from there. You could argue it's going to go to like b6 and c4, but that's kind of long-winded. I'd rather it control some dark squares and potentially hop into b4 if the opportunity arises. d3 looks kind of passive. d4 makes more sense to me, but okay. It's nothing major. We could go knight c6 and try to prepare the move e5. Which is probably the best idea, to be fair. Probably our best plan. We also defend e5 and d4, so if he goes knight f3, it's not obvious how he's getting in. Okay, that's an odd move. I guess my opponent was worried about knight d4 with a fork of the queen and the c2 pawn, so he defends b4, but he could always just play queen d1, and then my, my knight's kind of silly on d4. So 
My opponent's kind of wasting time with C3. It also weakens D3, so he's probably going to have to play D4 regardless, which obviously I want to see. Uh, I think... Hmm, knight F6 is good. Am I worried about Bishop G5? Because I can't hop into E4. I don't really want to double my pawns. We could start with H6, but that's kind of passive. We could go E5. We could just go E6, though. And maybe put our knight on E7 to go to maybe G6 or F5. D4 is an interesting move, but he would be stupid to exchange like that. And even if he does, because like he's 1400 ELO, he's decent at chess, but he might accept the trade because I'm higher rated than him as well. My rating is actually around 2000. This is just a rating climb series. So, you know, we drop it a bit so I can educate you guys better because more of you are going to be around this rating range um, than like my actual rating range. If um, like D4 and we get the exchange, like perfect. D3 is weak. Our knight's amazing. But he should not be doing that. It's a stupid idea. Um, I really want to go knight f6, but I don't like the idea of bishop to g5. That really annoys me. I mean, okay, if he does exchange his bishop, we could always just take back with the g pawn and open up the g file. Yeah, okay, I like that idea. Because it seems very reckless for white to castle queenside. Okay, he goes h3 anyway. Again, he's just wasting a lot of time here. e5 looks very tempting. I'm going to do it. Yes, I know the pawn is pinned. It's currently defended by the knight. He could go d4 or f4 to try and play on the pin. But we could always advance. Okay, bishop to g5. I think I want to play bishop to d6 to to uh, give more defense to e5. We could go bishop to e7 to not only defend the knight, but also break the pin on the pawn to prepare to castle. h6. We could try and like make him exchange, but he could always just retreat. And g3 would be a very nice square for the bishop. So I uh, don't really want to do that. Although if h... Oh, I was thinking about knight h5 jumping into f, um, f4, but the queen controls that square. So that would be silly to lose a piece for no reason. Uh, okay, I'm torn between bishop e7 and bishop to d6. I feel like bishop d6 is good. But, ah, no, it, it isn't good enough. It isn't good enough, because the problem is, if my opponent um, goes f4 to apply more pressure to my pawn, my idea previously was to go e4, and the point is that my knight supported the pawn, but he could take. I know f4 would be weak, but he could also do it with um, d4, and after push, then he could go maybe f3. Uh, I don't like it. I think bishop to e7 is more principled. Queen f5 doesn't look half bad. Applying pressure to a lot of things. Also defending e5. If he were to exchange, very nice. But queen f5, knight f3. We can't go e4 because the pawn is pinned. And obviously that's defending the bishop, so... Nah, don't love it. I'm going to go bishop to e7. I think it's maybe a little bit... Eh, is it unambitious? I don't know. It's quite a nice move. Really. I think I want to take with the bishop. If he goes d4, I'm going to castle. And my point is that he's wasted so much time moving all these pawns. So, bishop f6. We have a very nice setup. We control the dark squares very well. We also control the light squares with our pawns very well. We're going to castle. We have a semi-open c file. We can play for b5 and b4 to try and undermine the c file and get our rook active we could potentially try and make a break like e4 especially now the knight is vulnerable on f3 this is by no means a done deal but we definitely have the advantage in this position so let's castle get a rook on the e file and 
yeah, let's try and massage this position a bit. Again, queen f5 is always a nice idea, just to apply pressure to things. But we don't need to do it yet. I think rook to e8 can never be a bad move. Our bishop um, dominates this knight's movement, which is why he has now retreated the knight to try and get into g4. But I think g6 is um, the correct response here. So after knight g4, we drop our bishop back to g7. And just like with the knight on f3, we maintain our domination of the knight's forward movement. Again, I've, I speak about this in many, many videos because it's a very interesting and important concept to understand, like the domination of like a bishop versus a knight. Um, to be fair, a knight can actually dominate a bishop sometimes, but it's more so the other way around. Hmm, queen g4. If take, take, bishop drops back. We have a nice position, but I feel like we want to keep the queens on the board. His queen can't do much damage here anyway. Uh, let's say we go like queen c7, or queen d6 actually looks better. We keep an eye on the bishop and support the pawn. Something like f4. I don't think that's scary. Because we just like take, and if queen takes or rook takes, we have bishop to... Mm, no, if queen takes, we don't have that. Because f7 would hang, so queen c7 might be more accurate. So if f4 takes, if rook takes, then bishop to e5, we skewer the rook and the knight. And if queen takes, we also have bishop to e5, skewering the queen and the knight. But you can't take on f7 because our queen defends f7. So that looks pretty good to me. I don't really want to trade queens with him. We definitely have the advantage here. If something like queen c7, my opponent goes like knight to f3. That's fine. We can always play a move like h5 to kick the queen out. Again, if the knight goes back to f3, it's kind of wasted time going to h2. But again, we maintain this domination with our bishop. So I don't want to trade pieces with my opponent. Trading would ne I don't think it would be bad, necessarily. Like, we would still have an advantageous position, absolutely. But because I feel like I have the advantage, I want to, like, continue the pressure try to build up more and more of a positional advantage here and keeping the queens on gives me more attacking opportunities which I want to maintain. Okay the knight goes to d2. It doesn't have much of a future, it really doesn't because f if the knight goes to f3 then the h2 knight has no future. Sure it could go to g4 but then we just drop the bishop back to g7 and the queen needs to move to facilitate that. Um. Queen b6 puts a bit of pressure on. I don't think it's all that good though. The knight might try to go to b3 and then like c5, but it can get kicked out of c5 very easily. That's not really a concern. A move like rook to d8 or rook c8 would never be bad here. h5, while tempting to just attack the queen, I think the queen wants to move anyway. So I don't see the point in, like, pushing him to do that. Hmm, it's not obvious what I should do. Part of me wants to drop the bishop back to g7 preemptively and prepare the move f5 to take more space and potentially go e4. Put a rook on d8 so that if the d file opens, we have pressure on the knight. That looks pretty good. Also, if e4 is played, our knight can hop into e5. I like that idea. We could start with rook to d8, though, because I think the rook wants to go to d8 regardless. This pawn is also unprotected. So a move like queen f3, we don't want to come with a double attack. We could defend it with a move like queen to d8. I might have, like, kind of blundered that. We would have bishop to g5 putting pressure on the knight, to be fair, but yeah. I probably shouldn't allow that. Maybe we should draw the bishop back. It accomplishes the same idea of preparing rook to d8 and f5, but I would rather my pawn be vulnerable than my bishop, basically. b6 is a really tempting move here, with the idea of not allowing the knight to do anything. 
But I don't think the point is to go knight to c5. Because if knight c5... The only place it can go is d7. Or like queen d7 to offer a trade. So rook to d8 would stop that anyway. And also continue our plan of playing e4 at some point. Maybe my opponent wants to go d4 himself. So let's say rook d8 d4. But I, f mm, I don't know. We could push and continue pushing. B6 would stop his knight from getting in. We could also make use of the C4 square at some point. Potentially. It would block our bishop off a bit though. But we could try and maybe undermine his position with B5, B4 at some point. If this C3 pawn is defending D4. Let's go rook A to D8. Again, even if that is not the most clinical and accurate move in the position, it can't be bad. It can't be bad. We're just defending a central pawn. Our rook is on a more active square than it used to be. We are controlling one of the less defended squares in our position on d7. It, it's just a good move. Just an improving move. If d4... We could also consider f5. Because he has 1, 2, 3 defenders on d4. I have 1, 2, 3 attackers. So if d4, f5, his queen needs to maintain defense of the d-pawn. The queen could go to h4. Get out of the game. Or the queen could go to d1. Which is, again, just a bit out of the game. We could leave the tension. And maybe allow him to take us. Which is an option. Okay, rookie one. Again, it can never be a bad move, just centralizing the rook. You know, putting pressure on our e-pawn. Never a bad move. Um, yeah, I'm really tempted to play f5. Also because this diagonal is not weak. He has no light squared bishop. And the queen will struggle to access the diagonal. We could also always just go to h8 anyway in the future. So that's fine. There's this slightly interesting idea of going e4, and after takes, going knight to e5 to attack the queen. Uh, I don't think it does anything, though. It's just an interesting thing. I'd rather go e4 with f5 on the board to do this. That would be lovely. We'd also, like, stop this knight from getting back into the game very easily. Have to go, like, through f1. You can go on the dark squares, I suppose, but I'm not too fast. Uh, yeah, I think f5. I think f5. Yeah, it looks good. f5 if, um, queen a4. I don't think that's a problem. The queen is kind of active. We can't go b5 because of this. And if rook a8, queen b5, rook b8. The d-pawn hangs, also c5 is available. But that doesn't work. But the queen might be offside on a4. So I'm going to go f5. I'm going to go for it. I more am expecting the queen to go to a square like g3 or e2. Or maybe f3. Which, I mean, I'd love to see f3 to stop this knight from developing. Again, this is kind of a theme in this game. I'm trying to keep these knights out of the position and dominating the center helps a lot with trying to do that of course because if we control a lot of squares in the center with our pawns like we do right then it makes it difficult for my opponent's knights to like gallop behind and get into good outposts in my territory because white's most advanced pawns are on the third rank mine are on my fourth rank and yeah, my opponent does retreat his queen. I don't know why, I just kind of expected him to do it. Just instinct, I suppose. Um, no, I don't see the point. If he jumps in... I suppose a6 would hang. So maybe it is annoying. Because he could support it with d4. The b6 would be quite restrictive. It's not obvious what white's next move is. It really isn't. 
I quite like this. Yeah, I think B6. And we just keep advancing our pawns. We only have one pawn on its starting square. The rest of our pawns are advanced and just dominating his knights. We could consider pushing the A pawn to kick the knight out, but the knight is just as useless on B3 as it would be on D2 in my opinion, so I don't see the point. But now, we have a better position. We have way more space, we have more active pieces. Now how do we capitalize on it? That is the question. I actually don't know how. It's not obvious. It's not obvious. E4 is tempting. I think that's probably the way forward. If he locks the center shut, we push the F pawn, get our rook on the F file, I think. If he exchanges, I probably take back with the D pawn, open up the D file for us. And then our knight can hop into squares like e5 and d3, which would be pretty devastating. So let's go for e4. I am running a little bit low on time at this point. So I want to not necessarily make the absolute perfect move in every position, but just make a move that makes sense and requires less force in calculation. Because that's obviously the more pragmatic approach to be taking here, because I'd rather have a plus one point two advantage than a plus two advantage if the plus two advantage means that I'm going to be down to 10 seconds and the plus 1.2 advantage means that I'm going to have three minutes right makes sense this is blitz chess not classical it's an interesting move I obviously can't take because of this okay what about knight e5 threatening d3 if d4 is played, I can play knight to c4. That is a really nice knight. Hard to kick out. Because if he moves the knight and goes b3, then c3 will be weak, and c3 supports d4. Um, Bishop e5 is an interesting move. Because we attack the knight. The knight has to go to f1. And then we can take on d3 because we block the e-file. We attack the rook. Let's say rook to e3. Then I don't know what my follow-up is because I'm going to lose the pawn. And I don't want to lose the pawn. So it doesn't quite work. Knight e5 looks pretty good. I'm going to go for it. Again, I don't know if it's the best move, but it's a decent move. So I'm going to play it. If takes, we could maybe start with knight d3, attacking the queen, and then let's say queen d1 or queen d2, probably queen d2. Um, then we can take on e4 with uh, the d pawn to open up the d file. We have a strong knight putting pressure on b2 on f2. Um, potentially hopping into f4 to put pressure on the rook and the light squares. We can decide when we get closer to the time, but we continue to lock this knight out. This knight doesn't have an obvious way into the position. Yeah, it could go to like d5, but not now, because we're going to go knight to d3. I think we could start with taking, but I don't want to. Let's go knight d3. Attack the queen. Of course my opponent has to move the queen now. And then we just take back. Open up the d file. If um, Well what I was saying before is now the knight can't go to d4. Because we open up the d file to give our rook defense of the d4 square as well. Ooh, okay. Bold. Very bold. Do we not just win after knight f4? Attacking the queen, attacking the rook? I think that wins, no? Yeah, I don't see... Because we just go up a clean exchange. And we're going to be causing even more havoc afterwards. It's not even like we're just up an exchange because we're already positionally winning. <laughs> that looks good to me. 
There's no checks. Yeah, awesome. Our queen defends f4, the knight attacks the rook, our rook attacks the queen. It's just a double attack, essentially. And obviously, white will be saving his queen over his rook, which means we're going to be going up a clean exchange. And then the, it doesn't stop there because the pressure will continue to build. This knight is still stupid. This knight still only has one square, and if it goes there, it's going to get taken. This rook isn't in the game. Our rooks are beautiful. This bishop isn't the best, but it could go to like e5 to try and put, go to like g3, which would be decent. Okay, yeah, let's just snap the rook. I think. Yeah, yeah, snap it. And now we can see what we want to do, I suppose. A6 is hanging, so B5 is tempting. If he takes, we take with the rook. That's great. We also restrict the C4 square in the future. I'm going to play it. Again, it's an easy move to play, and I'm low on time with a winning position. So a move like queen to C4 would be quite nice to try and offer a trade of queens, because that would obviously favor us. We could have taken on f3 and opened up an attack on the queen, which would have forced queen to f3. Uh, but, like, why rush? Why rush? We have time in this position. And we can just continue to massage our advantage. It's not obvious how white gets back into this game. Okay, he takes. We should take with the rook to open up the e-file for ourselves. Let's do it. He, of course, frees up the f3 square for his knight. Uh, so you could argue that I should have taken with the e-pawn. Maybe that's better. We get a passed pawn. We continue to restrict his knight. But he can go to g4 if we take with a pawn. And g4, again, the knight will be dominated because of this geometry where the bishop is... Where there's two squares between the bishop and the knight. Um, like, straight or across. But, uh, yeah, I'd rather just be very restrictive. I want to open up uh, the position for my pieces to get involved. Um... Okay, bishop e5 is kind of tempting. Because my idea is to attack the knight. And if the knight goes to f3, to play bishop to g3 to get his king in a potential mating net. Because we'll be cutting off the king's escape routes. Rook e8 is also a good move. Just potentially trying to go to the back rank. He can access the uh, d4 square now. But I'm not worried. We can always just pin the knight to the queen and the king if he does that. My opponent's playing some decent moves to be fair. But mm, we're fine. Let's go rook d to e8. Because I just want to apply pressure on the e-file. We can try and get into e2 as well. To cause some havoc on the second rank. It might be good for me to keep my bishop on g7. So that I can play like king to h8. And keep my king nice and safe. Because it can maybe be vulnerable on this diagonal. My opponent is controlling the c5 square. But if the queen goes there, I obviously trade queens. If the knight goes there, the queen is going to be overloaded. After a move like rook to e2. Well not overloaded sorry. But like deflected. Because the queen will have to escape attack. And won't be able to keep an eye on the knight. So again I'm trying to restrict the white position. And not let him do anything. Even if the knight gets to c5. Other than attacking the rook. It attacks the a pawn as well I suppose. So I don't really want to allow that. And of course rook to e8 stops it. Because of rook to e2. Of course, we are also looking at the e1 square, like I mentioned. It's just a very nice position. Bishop to e5 may be following. Also gives our king the g7 square to stay safe. Yeah, I think our king is nice and safe. It's fine. His knights are very far back, so they're not causing any havoc right now. And I'd like to keep it that way. Like I think I just mentioned previously, the knight can go to d4. We could exchange and force the pawn to take. Or we could try and play a move like queen to c5 or b6 to try and force a trade of queens, which would be great. A move like rook d1 would get his rook more active. 
maybe that's what he's going to play. Knight f3 also makes some sense. Try and get the knight in the game on a square like g5 or d4. <sighs> I'm not that impressed. Oh, I don't think I'd be that impressed by a move like knight to f3. Not very scary, I don't think. Let's say rook to e2. The queen doesn't have that many squares. The knight does defend e1, which is useful for my opponent. But we could literally just go pawn hunting and just try and grab the b2 pawn, make the c3 pawn fall. Probably take over our queen, actually, to keep our bishop in defense. I'd like to make my opponent rather than just win pawns, but, uh, you know, it's a nice option to have just to win a ton of material. Attacks don't have to end in checkmate. I've mentioned that many times before. Many other people have mentioned that many times before who are far better than me at chess. But whilst I'd love to checkmate my, my opponent on the back rank and play a move like bishop to g3 to like restrict his king's movement, you know, being up like five points of material would also be pretty nice, and I would hope that I could convert that. My opponent's taking a bit of time here, which is good for us, because I don't want to calculate anything necessarily. I want to just think about the position and the potential ideas of the position, both for me and for my opponent, which is why I was looking at moves like knight f3, knight d4, rook d1. They're all ideas. a4 doesn't work because he's, that square is being controlled twice. Uh, other than that, I don't know, like, knight f1 isn't amazing. He's controlling some dark squares, I suppose, but, like, eh, just rook to e2. Knight f3 looks like a more active move for him to be making. It's really funny, his queen can't go anywhere forwards apart from f3, because we control everything. Of course, the queen could go to c5 and trade herself off, but... My opponent is down in exchange. He does not want to be trading right now. Okay, he's still thinking. I hope he does make a move and not just quit, because that would not be cool of him. Um, bad sportsmanship. That would be. Uh, rook, F, rook F4 is also an idea. Which is knight F3. Um, okay. Rook F1. I don't see what that does because the f-file is shot. My pawn is well defended. The rookie two looks like a good move. Um. Oh, I have a nice idea. I have a nice idea. We're gonna go rookie two, and I want queen f3. Yes. Wait, no, it doesn't work. My idea was bishop to e5 to attack the knight, but the rook hangs, and this exists, so no, it doesn't work. What am I on about? What am I on about? Um, that's actually slightly annoying. Queen e5 is nice. I'm going to do it. The point is to stop queen to d5 and just create a triple barrel on the e file. I'm also threatening a move like queen e3 check to force a trade of queens. And then our, like, slightly weak king would not be an issue anymore. We also maintain defense of c5 to stop knight to c5. Okay, knight d4. Surely we force a trade of queens. I think that makes sense. Let's do it. Queen e3 check. If queen takes, of course, we take with this rook so we don't lose the exchange back. Um... And then we just have a pleasant position. I mean, my opponent has a nice outpost on d4. But I don't see what he's going to do from that square. Like, there's no obvious way for him to get in. Getting a queen trade is essential in this position, in my opinion. Because our only downside of our position is we have a few holes which the queen could access. And we have this weak diagonal which the queen could access. Without the queen, he can't do any of that. Wait, is it better to do this first? No. Let's take. I was just wondering. It's, it's good to check alternatives, obviously. But um, this is actually worse because we're going to pick up b2 as well. And we're now up an exchange and a pawn. 
and a2 is weak and c3 is weak and if we get rook to e2 in then g2 is also weak so i think we've avoided any potential catastrophes with his queen infiltrating my position on square like b2 c3 or d5 and now it's just clean up essentially that knight is not doing a thing i'm going to get this knight off the board first you can argue i'm giving him a pass d pawn but i don't really care i don't think because we can just pick it up with rook to d2 i believe uh rook d2 if the knight retreats then we can take and then the knight is arguably less active if rook to f4, that's a very silly rook. Yeah, now let's take. We will be able to stop this pawn pretty easily. We could try and get greedy and go for the second rank, but I don't see the point. Let's just play rook to d8. Uh, yeah, his knight can get in, but what's it going to do? Uh, not a whole lot, I don't think. Okay. He's going to push. Makes sense. It is his last option, really. Uh, we could try pushing our own pawn. Which I think is the best idea. Could bring the king in. Could also just push. Let's push. Yeah, this is his idea, I think, but it's, I don't think it works. Because the issue is, if he goes knight to c6, we can just take, I believe. Yeah, we can just take. Because we're going to promote if his rook leaves the back rank. So that is absolutely fine. Promote with check. We are up. What? A queen for a knight. This would be a great move, but he controls that square. And my opponent resigns. Oh, well, sorry about that. Um, very, very nice game. I'm very happy with that. That could be a very high accuracy game. It's the Karo Khan at its finest, really, because we my opponent played a weird opening. We consolidated on the light squares. We took full control of the center. And we, okay, traded down a little bit. We didn't have an obvious win, but we had a clear positional advantage. And we just grinded the position. My opponent made a stake. We capitalized on it. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the game. I will do a short analysis afterwards, so I'd encourage you to stick around for that. Let's get into it. All right, so the game analysis is pretty similar to what I was saying about the game itself. We clearly had a small advantage from the opening, really, which my opponent mishandled. Obviously, bishop c4 is not the best move. It's playable, but it's, you know, not good. But the point is, after d5, right, from my understanding, either you go bishop to b3 and try and sacrifice this pawn, and then go, like, f3 and try and castle, play a move like knight g5 and put a ton of pressure on the f7 pawn. Or what you do is you take, and after take, go bishop to b3. The idea is not to go bishop to b5 check. I mean, you're not losing, but it's not good. So that's what my opponent did. We got, by the way, 89.9% accuracy for the game. So really, really good. And so the computer says, you know, we had an advantage from the opening. It, build, it, it built and built and built. And then we had that tactic that won the exchange. And then it was just clearly in our favor from there on. And then we found a pretty nice tactic at the very end. So, okay. We have this very strange opening from my opponent. We go bishop to d7. If my opponent exchanges, then I was going to take with the queen, play like knight c6, potentially e5, and just kind of do the same setup that we had in the game, really. Except this time we had the inclusion of a6. The computer likes doing this and then queen to d7. And then after queen takes, taking with the king. But I didn't see the need to trade queens. It's definitely playable if you play against someone your own rating, especially as the black pieces. Like, black clearly has a slightly better position. His king is active, which is a good thing because it's, you know, white has no queen, so it's more difficult to attack the king. And the king can always tuck itself away on, like, c7. And black already has a pawn on d5, can continue expanding in the center, get on the open c file. 
It's a pretty nice position. But I wanted to force my opponent to take because a move like bishop to d6 would just be very silly. And we take back with the queen. d3 was odd. Again, I expected d4 instead. Actually taking some space. And this would have made it more difficult for us to go e5. We would have had to go for more of a typical Cairo structure with e6. Knight c6, bishop d6, knight f6. Rook c8, castle. Very easy position to play. But in this case, after d3... We were able to take way more space and play e5, taking a massive center. Bishop g5 was played. And I did consider queen f5. The computer likes it. I chose bishop e7, which is a slight inaccuracy. But my opponent takes, which was just unnecessary. He did not need to take. He could have just kept developing. And, you know, something like castle, castle, rook e1. Let's say knight d2, rook d8. Okay, no, not rook d8. Because we'll be hanging a pawn. Okay, well, we'd probably defend the pawn first. Or, let's say, uh, knight d2. Something like h6 and then takes, takes. Rook e8, rook d1. Sorry, rook d1, e1. Oh my god, I can't speak. Rook d8. Of course, I'm just playing this without really thinking. But this is the kind of position I'd expect to get. My opponent instead just made it very easy for me by taking immediately. We take back with the bishop. Knight f3, castle, castle, rook f8. Just play normal moves. The computer likes the idea of putting the a rook on e8. And I think the point is... Wow, this is interesting. So I was thinking g6, bishop, g7, and f5. But the computer wants bishop to d8. And let's say... Uh, no, not that. Let's say rook a2, e1, and then f5 like this. And I guess the... Bishop can reroute to c7 or b6 to get on these diagonals. Very interesting idea. But, okay, we castle. I move my f rook over, g6. I liked queen to c7. Um, I was concerned about... Oh, I didn't need to be concerned about that. Because my queen defends the pawn. Queen g4, queen c7. If queen f3 now, then we have queen d6 and we're okay. I did miss that, admittedly, though. Here we go, bishop g7, knight b3. Again, it looks like it makes sense, but it's not the best move because the knight has no future. Rook ad1, rook fe1, f5. I take more space. b6 is a mistake. e4 is better. I'm just going straight for the kill. If takes, takes, we're good. If my opponent advances. It's not obvious what the plan is. The computer likes bishop to f8, maybe going to d6. And I suppose you want to transfer the rook to f8 and start pushing the f-pawn down the board. So that's my, that would be my plan. Instead, we push e4 now. Knight e5, I was quite happy with this. We go knight to d3 first. We can take, but this is a more forcing line to go knight d3 immediately. We could have gone knight f4 immediately, actually. I don't see the point, actually. I don't know what the difference is. My opponent goes f3, though, which is a mistake because of the knight f4 tactic. A better move would have been, like, queen c2 to make sure you're not getting a discovered attack on you. Black is still better, but I'm also low on time, and it's not obvious how I continue to improve. I don't know, something like this. My position is nice, but there's no obvious way in. We would have, of course, grinded this position, and I hope that I would have won it, but my opponent made it easy. And people always make mistakes, right? It's not a fault of mine that I couldn't find an obvious way in. I just continued to build slight advantages till we got to like a, you know, minus 1.8 position. And then my opponent buckled. This is how chess works. We, of course, capitalize on it and continue to make, you know, nice improving moves. Rook DE8, Rook F1, Rook E2, Queen F3. Here, the computer... It likes my move. The computer would have just taken on b2, but the computer doesn't have feelings, so it doesn't get scared. I would have been a little bit concerned about something like this. Should I have been? Maybe not, but like, I don't want to allow anything. So I went queen e5, and my opponent allows me to trade queens with him. We take take, rook b2, and things are quite simple from here. Maybe I didn't need to exchange my bishop off, but it makes things a lot easier. Take on d1, my opponent tries to push, but I just push right back. And the point is that my opponent is just too slow. He's way too slow. I could go rook a1 immediately, to be fair, but rook d6 is a bit more fancy. 
and after rook to d6, queen, um, pawn to b1, queen, and it's game over. King h2, and queen to e4 just wins because you can't defend g2. So, yeah, that's the game. A very, a very nice Cairo Khan game, to be fair. Like, we didn't do anything crazy. Found a couple of nice tactics. One with winning the exchange and one with sacrificing the rook for the pawn. I'd argue both of them were quite simple, quite obvious. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and it is great to be back.